My name is Daniel Check, and I am a postdoctoral scholar with Breakthrough Listen at the Berkeley City Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. I spent most of my time working on Breakthrough Listen's commensal SETI system attached to Meerkat, and I'll speak more about the system later in this talk. But beforehand, I'll first introduce SETI and the Breakthrough Listen program itself. Later, I'll speak more about the Breakthrough Listen system from both a hardware and software perspective, as well as some of the research we are doing surrounding target selection. Are we alone in the universe? This is one of the most universal and most profound questions considered by humankind. Some of you may already be familiar with the Drake equation, illustrated here in this graphic by the SETI Institute. This equation was developed in 1961 by Dr. Frank Drake, one of the pioneers of the field of SETI. The Drake equation is used to estimate the approximate number of communicating extraterrestrial intelligences in our own Milky Way galaxy. Many of the values and of the terms in this equation are highly conjectural, and it is intended to stimulate thought and dialogue on the topic. The terms in the equation are as follows. N represents the number of extraterrestrial intelligences in our galaxy with which communication might be possible. R represents the average rate of star formation per year in our galaxy. Fp represents the fraction of those stars which actually have planets. The term Ne represents the average number of those planets that may be suitable to develop life. The next term, Fl, represents the fraction of those planets that actually succeed in developing life. The next term is Fi, which represents the fraction of those planets on which intelligent life actually arises. And Fc represents those planets for which the intelligent life develops interstellar communication. And L is the average length of time that such intelligences continue to communicate. The last four terms of the equation are quite speculative, as we only really have one sample from which to extrapolate, and that is ourselves. However, we have started to pin down established values for the terms R, FP, and NE of the equation. R, the average rate of star formation per year in our galaxy, is now known to be between 1.5 and 3 stars per year. FP, the fraction of those stars which have planets, is now estimated to be close to 1. That is, that nearly all stars have planets. This is very encouraging. The original estimate made in 1961 was that 20 to 50% of all stars would have planets. So the fact that nearly all of them have planets is quite encouraging. And increasingly good estimates are being made for the term NE, representing the average number of planets per star with planets that may actually be able to host life. For example, a recent study looking at types of stars believed to be suitable to host life-bearing planets estimated that of those stars, approximately one in four may host a rocky Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. That is the region around the star for which liquid water could exist on the surface of the planet. If you would like to explore the topic further and perhaps develop your own estimates for the different terms in the Drake equation and make your own estimate of the number of communicating extraterrestrial intelligences in our Milky Way galaxy, you may be interested in visiting this website that we've created which provides a tool where you can adjust the values according to your own estimations. I have included two quotes here that I think exemplify some important aspects of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence.
The first is by the late Dr. Carl Sagan, one of the pioneers in the field. He argues for the importance of an experimental search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He states that no a priori arguments on the subject can be compelling or should be used as a substitute for an observational program. The second quote is by Dr. Jill Tarter, another of the most well-known contributors in the field of SETI. She states that we don't know how to identify intelligence over interstellar distances. So what we do instead is to use technology for a proxy. Next, I will introduce Breakthrough Listen. Breakthrough Listen is one of the breakthrough initiatives, programs of scientific and technological exploration, probing the big questions of life in the universe. The breakthrough initiatives were founded in 2015 by Yuri and Julia Milner. Breakthrough Listen will constitute the most comprehensive search for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence conducted thus far, with $100 million committed over 10 years to the search. More than a million stars and other objects, including Exotica, will be observed. All data and software will be open source, and I'll speak a little bit more about this in the following slides. I've included some links that might be useful to you here if you're interested in investigating or exploring some Breakthrough Listen data or some of the software that Breakthrough Listen has developed. The inset screenshot on the right uh, shows a little bit of information about one of the software projects we have, Breakthrough Listen IO Methods for Python, that may be of use to you if you're interested in exploring some of Breakthrough Listen's public data. Breakthrough Listen began with three major facilities initially. On the left, the automated planet finder at the Lick Observatory in the US for optical searches. In the center, the 100 meter Green Bank Radio Telescope also in the US for radio searches. And on the right, the Parkes Radio Telescope, a 64 meter dish for Southern Hemisphere radio searches. Since then, Breakthrough Listen has expanded to many other facilities all around the world. including Meerkat, which will become one of Breakthrough Listen's most important facilities. Breakthrough Listen on Meerkat was announced in 2018 at the International Astronautical Congress, which was held in Germany. In the coming slides, I'll explain a little bit about why Meerkat is so well suited for commensal SETI surveys and how Breakthrough Listen's system on Meerkat will actually work. I'll also provide some information on Breakthrough Listen's hardware and I'll also speak a little bit about the research we are doing into target selection for commensal observations. Meerkat is perfect for commensal SETI for a number of reasons. Firstly, Meerkat's location is ideal. It's in a radio quiet reserve in a remote region of South Africa, so there's very little RFI or radio frequency interference. It has excellent sensitivity and has multiple receiver bands, including L-band. And very importantly, data is available to multiple users simultaneously, which has important implications for commensal SETI surveys, which I'll speak a little bit more about in subsequent slides. And also another fundamentally important aspect of Meerkat is that it has a wide primary field of view, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide. So the Breakthrough Listen system on Meerkat will conduct fully automated commensal observing and will implement a number of different approaches, including an incoherent sum mode to take advantage of Meerkat's full field of view, beamforming, where Breakthrough Listen intends to form 64 simultaneous beams to look at objects in the primary field of view. Uh, there will also be a modular online processing pipeline, which I'll speak a little bit more about in coming slides. And the aim is to observe more than a million nearby sources and objects via commensal observations. In the previous slide, I spoke about the importance of Meerkat's wide field of view and how this will be useful for commensal SETI. This is illustrated in this useful diagram on the right hand side of the slide, where you can see uh, how a commensal observation might work. 
So in the center of the circle, you can see a green disk, which represents the target being observed by the primary observer. But the full field of view is given within that dotted region, within the dotted line that surrounds the other blue disks. And those blue disks represent targets of interest for SETI, which can all be observed simultaneously alongside a primary observer by forming individual beams on each of them. This diagram gives an indication of how Breakthrough Listen system will fit in in the greater Meerkat system. So if one takes a look at the flow of data, the antennas and digitizers send data to the correlated beam former and the science data processor, which distribute the data to users via a 40 gigabit multicast ethernet network. So this ethernet network distributes the data simultaneously to multiple experiments, such as those listed below. And each of them are given the designation user supplied equipment. So Beal use is Breakthrough Listen's user supplied equipment. So Breakthrough Listen will conduct SETI searches commensally alongside other experiments, such as transient searches or searches for fast radio bursts and so on. This shows a screenshot of the telescope interface during a commensal observation that includes Breakthrough Listen's user supplied equipment alongside a number of other experiments such as APSUs and FBFUs, which you can see on the right hand side. On the left, you can see an in progress observation. There are many other details in this screenshot, but they're not quite as relevant to the presentation that I'm giving now. I just thought I would include the screenshot to show what an actual commensal observation might look like from a telescope control point of view. So how does commensal observing actually work for Breakthrough Listen system? Well, this diagram illustrates uh, some of the aspects of our system. On the top left, you can see uh, the orange cloud, which represents the Meerkat control and monitoring system. Now this system distributes all sorts of useful information to our backend interface. This information can include data on the pointing of the telescope, what's being observed currently, the band, what modes are being used, even down to things uh, like the weather. And this information is passed on to our target selector and our processing nodes. Now the target selector selects from our targets database, the, the targets for observation in the immediate field of view of the telescope. And it also applies selection criteria uh, to decide which objects in the current field of view should be observed and in what order. And this information is also passed on to the processing nodes. Now the processing nodes represent computers that will uh, ingest data from the individual antennas and process the data according to whatever we require for our SETI search. So this diagram illustrates how a commensal observation is actually controlled by Breakthrough Listen system. In the next slide, I'll show another diagram which shows precisely how the actual data from the antennas are processed and handled. So everything that takes place on a processing node This diagram illustrates the modular online pipeline that I spoke about earlier. In other words, how the breakthrough listening system handles the data from the telescope itself. By online, we mean processing the data in a real time manner. That is that the breakthrough listening system keeps up with the data as it arrives from the telescope and that the data are processed as they arrive as opposed to storing them and processing them later offline. The data are available from the telescope at different stages in the processing pipeline of Meerkat itself. And for Breakthrough Listen, we have selected to receive the data in the form of channelized antenna voltages. I'll provide an example of what these antenna channelized voltages actually look like in later slides. But in the meantime, I'll just give an overview of how the data are passed around 
the different components of the breakthrough listen system. So initially the data are received from the network in the form of antenna channelized voltages and stored in our NVMe buffer, which I will give more details on in the next few slides. And then also handed off to the various components of our pipeline, which will then ultimately select candidate signals that uh, the components in the pipeline have identified as potential signals of interest for later analysis. Much of our work in the coming months and years will be centered around these pieces of the pipeline, which handle uh, beam forming or forming an incoherent sum, which I'll also speak about a little bit more later, and detecting signals of interest and performing various kinds of analyses on them, such as anomaly detection, to look for signals that might be very unusual or of great interest to us in our search. There's another reason why we favor this approach with interchangeable pipeline components like this. And that has to do with the nature of the SETI searches that we will undertake. So as I will illustrate in later slides, our search that involves looking at the nearest or some of the nearest million stars will be conducted rather quickly and there'll be plenty of scope and time to conduct other SETI searches. And these other SETI searches might require or might be uh, better suited to other pipeline components. So it would be very convenient for us to have the capability to switch out different uh, pipeline components, depending on the scenario at hand. For example, we may want to conduct a search for dispersed pulses. These are signals that have, or brief signals that have been uh, transmitted over very great distances, interstellar distances, through the interstellar medium, and they exhibit a characteristic sweep in frequency. So if we wanted to search specifically for signals of this nature, we may have a particular pipeline component that is very good at doing just that one task that we could switch in and out. There's another reason why we might need a pipeline like this at Meerkat. And that has to do with the great data rate uh, that is produced by Meerkat when it's operating. For example, at L-band, each antenna will produce around about 27 gigabits per second of data that we will have to handle. And as you can imagine, this will fill storage rather quickly. So at breakthrough listen systems at other facilities, such as Green Bank and Parks, these telescopes that I mentioned in an earlier slide, um, all the data are stored in perpetuity on uh, hard disks. And unfortunately, we just don't have that luxury at Meerkat because the data rates are so high that storage is just impractical. So we will have to store regions of interest or candidate signals and conduct all that processing in real time rather than the former model of storing all the data and performing multiple offline analyses afterwards. Earlier, I mentioned that we are storing the data in buffers made from NVMe modules. So these NVMe modules, which we use in pairs, are just the same as the SSDs or solid state drives that you have in, your, in many of your laptops. You can see an example of one on the top left. Now, the reason we use these drives is that in this paired up format, we can still achieve the large data rates required to receive data from the telescope, um, while giving us a much larger buffer than we might achieve with normal computer RAM. On the top right, we have a graph which shows that uh, each pair can handle 35 gigabits per second of data, which is uh, certainly enough to keep up with the 27 gigabits per second of data I mentioned earlier that we require to handle from uh, the, the antennas in L-band. And on the bottom right, you can see that for our use case, where we write each drive completely full and then empty it and then write it again, which is a very unusual 
pattern of using these drives uh, in when one considers a consumer setting. But in this scenario, you can see that the endurance is very good. We, in our tests, we managed to write more than 20 petabytes per pair, which is an enormous amount of data and many times the expected lifespan of these drives. The plots here show the performance of these drives uh, when being used during an actual commensal observation that we undertook uh, a few weeks ago. And you can see in the top plot the write rate, which is very stable during the five minute observation. And in the bottom plot, you can see the uh, capacity usage of the drives, and you can see that it's they fill up nice and linearly over time. So, so far, they've been performing really well. I mentioned earlier that I would give an example of what the data that we receive actually looks like. So for a single processing node, we'll receive a small amount of data from each antenna. So here in this plot, you can see time on the x-axis and antenna number on the y-axis. So on the y-axis, one would normally see frequency. So what you're seeing here, instead of one large span of frequency, you see 16 small strips of the same frequency range, one each for each antenna. If we zoom in on the strip of the band provided by one of the antennas, we can see some features in the recording. This recording actually contains individual single pulses from the Vila pulsar. So if you look carefully in the zoomed in area, you might be able to see some individual bright pulses from the Vila pulsar. Incidentally, the Vila pulsar is the brightest known pulsar. In an earlier slide, I mentioned that we will be implementing at least two modes of observing, one being an incoherent sum and another being coherent beamforming. So coherent beamforming is when one creates electronic beams that are electronically steered and pointed at objects within the field of view, as illustrated in the diagram that I've shown here again. Um, so during primary observations, we'll be able to observe individual sources uh, that are within the field of view represented by the blue disks. And this approach comes with uh, several advantages and disadvantages. Most notably, you get the full strength sensitivity of the array if you do coherent beamforming on an individual target. However, the field of view or the area in the sky that the beam that you form covers is very small relative to Meerkat's full primary field of view. And there's quite a high computational cost associated with forming these beams. So there's a limit to the number of simultaneous concurrent uh, beams that we will be able to form at any one time. I also spoke about the incoherent sum mode. Now, this mode works quite differently in that the data from all the antennas is merely summed together. So one is able to observe the full primary field of view of the telescope, which is as large as one degree in L band. And the disadvantage of this approach is that sensitivity is reduced by a factor of the square root of the number of antennas. This can be derived with the radiometer equation, but the result is that uh, for a full meerkat array of 64 antennas, a coherent beam will, a coherently formed beam will achieve a sensitivity of uh, eight times greater than the incoherent sum. However, the field of view of that coherent beam will be tiny in comparison with the incoherent sum. One other interesting consideration uh, when doing the incoherent sum is that uh, given the system that we're implementing here uh, on Meerkat, we will have all the raw antenna channelized voltages stored in the NVMe buffers, which means that we may well be able to do uh, beamforming in post-processing. 
So if we're able to detect a signal in the incoherent sum somewhere, we can do localization and beamforming after detection. In this slide and the next, I'll speak a little bit about the actual physical hardware that we are installing in the Karoo data rack area at the Meerkat radio telescope, where we will be conducting our data processing. In 2019, we installed one eighth of the full system that we intend to install at Meerkat. Uh, with the help of three Northwest University interns, we installed 16 processing nodes, one head node and one storage node. Now this system, which is currently up and running on site, uh, is capable of handling the full band for 16 antennas. So for a full uh, Meerkat array of 64 antennas, uh, this uh, small portion of the system can't keep up, but it can handle the full data rate from uh, 16 individual antennas. Having shown that that small system of 16 processing nodes functions and uh, works as expected, we are now ready to install the next 52 processing nodes and three storage nodes, which together with the first 16 machines will constitute one half of the ultimate deployment we intend to make at Meerkat. So we're very excited uh, at the prospect of being able to handle the full uh, bandwidth of uh, Meerkat at L-band from all 64 antennas. And uh, you can see here that the size of the uh, shipment that we're uh, going to install at the Meerkat site uh, in the coming months. Here in these images, you can see all the computers packaged and ready to ship from their supplier uh, in the US. In the next three slides, I will go over the target selection process we have been working on and conducting research on for the Meerkat Commensal SETI survey. So to begin with, the Meerkat 1 million star sample will be selected from the nearest stars in the Gaia data release 2. The Gaia database is a database of stars and various attributes such as their distance from Earth, which has been put together by the Gaia satellite, um, which has provided a wealth of information about uh, the stars in our own galaxy and stellar populations. The full Gaia data release two sample numbers in the billions of stars. So a subselection of the nearest stars has been compiled by a former Breakthrough Listen intern, Logan Pierce, from which we will draw our 1 million stars uh, when observing commensally on Meerkat. We will also observe objects in other catalogs opportunistically, such as Exotica. So the Exotica catalog, which you can read more about at the link below, includes objects such as one of every known type of celestial object and extreme examples of these objects, as well as other unusual phenomena that we know of. In this slide and the next, I speak about some of the difficulties one might encounter when conducting commensal SETI observations and some of the extreme cases of primary observations that one might have to handle. For example, in this slide, I speak about the Laduma Large Survey Project, which consists of more than 3,000 hours on a single pointing. So very quickly, we will have exhausted all the stars within the primary field of view, uh, according to our desired sensitivity levels. And so we will have to think of other ways and other things to do with the time we have available to us. Some possibilities might be to look at other catalogs, as I mentioned before, or perhaps we could observe the individual targets for longer 
which would enable us to place better constraints on the intermittency of potential extraterrestrial transmitters. Um, it's quite reasonable to expect that extraterrestrial transmitters might not be pointing at Earth continuously for all time, and rather that they might be spending a little bit of time on multiple targets. And therefore, if we observe for too short a time, we might miss any potential transmissions. So that's one option. Another option might be to really observe the objects in the field of view for very long periods of time, which would allow us to integrate the data and place much better constraints on the power levels of any potential extraterrestrial transmitters. The plot on the right shows the number of stars in the primary field of view for the Laduma pointing uh, at different distances. So you can see that all around about 160 stars fall within about 2000 parsecs. In the previous slide, I showed one of the extreme cases of commensal observing where one has to handle an observation which lasts many thousands of hours on a single pointing. Now, in this slide, I illustrate uh, one of the other extremes where one has many, more than a thousand individual short pointings that one might have to deal with. So an example of this might be the mere time pulsar timing array, which consists of many short duration pulsar observations. Now, in the plot on the right, I illustrate the number of beams required to observe every object within the primary field of view for each pointing in this mere time pulsar timing array and the number of pointings for each. So you can see that there are many pointings for which more than 64 beams will be required to observe all the objects within the primary field of view. So a number of uh, other options are required in order to deal with this situation. So some possibilities might be to simply conduct an incoherent sum and capture the full field of view at the cost of sensitivity. Or one might triage the objects in the field of view um, and prioritize objects according to a set of criteria such as distance or stellar type. And another consideration might be the likelihood that we would be able to observe these objects commensally again during a future commensal observation. Continuing on from the previous slide, if one considers that the pulsars I mentioned in the previous slide are each observed repeatedly, once per month each, one can calculate how quickly we will observe all the targets in the primary field of view. So assuming a thousand pulsars roundabout, each observed for about five minutes each, repeated each once per month, we can see that within about six months, the breakthrough listen system will have observed around about 300,000 stars. So this illustrates the power of Meerkat for commensal SETI. So this is one part of one of the eight large survey projects. So this uh, rate at which we observe stars in this hypothetical example is only one tiny fraction of the time of the telescope. So the true rate of um, observation will be much higher. So we can see that we will very rapidly reach our goal of observing a million of the nearby stars to Earth. I will speak briefly about human capacity development in this slide. In 2019, uh, Breakthrough Listen conducted uh, several lectures and tutorials on SETI at the African Radio Interferometry Winter School, which was held in Chefstrom at Northwest University. Uh, we also engaged in some public outreach lectures. You can see an image uh, on the right of one of those. And there are a number of new pro projects in development, uh, which we will provide more information about shortly. But for the moment, these will be mostly in an online format, given the current situation. Finally, to conclude, 
Meerkat is uniquely suited for commensal SETI. I have illustrated this in a number of previous slides, and one can see that all of the data are available all the time for potential users. And not only this, but uh, Meerkat's large field of view allows many objects to be observed during commensal observations, as we saw in the previous slide, which showed how quickly we'll observe a large number of stars during commensal observations. The Breakthrough Listen system on Meerkat will conduct perhaps the most extensive SETI survey ever conducted, and it will conduct fully automated commensal observing of more than a million nearby stars and other objects, along with the pseudo real-time processing pipeline, which will operate in situ at the telescope in the Karoo data rack area. I will leave you with this uh, fantastic image produced by Meerkat on the right here. This is the Deep 2 image. I encourage you to look it up on the, on the link below. Uh, but suffice to say that all those bright white dots are radio galaxies. And it illustrates the something of the scale of the universe, as you can see in this image which is only a few degrees on a side. So it's a tiny region in the sky, which contains many thousands of galaxies. Thank you for your time and for your attention. And please don't hesitate to reach out. I've provided a number of links here below where you can contact us.